Hey everyone, I'm Davis, and I'm standing here outside DTE headquarters, located right here in the heart of Detroit. Today, you and I are gonna explore the awesome power of renewable energy on DTE's first ever virtual field trip. Now, when you're connecting to Wi-Fi, streaming your favorite shows, maybe grabbing a snack from the fridge, do you think about how much easier energy makes our lives? DTE has been powering Michigan for more than 150 years, even before Edison invented the light bulb. But where and how we generate that energy is changing. How many of you know what renewable energy is? Seriously, raise your hand. Any idea? Renewable energy is a big deal. It's the reason we're here today, and it may even help save our planet. For years, when we generated energy, it was based on sources that were finite, like coal, for example. But today, we're reimagining how we power our homes, our businesses, and our vehicles. We're shifting to energy sources that are cleaner and won't run out when we use them. Essentially, renewable energy is power we generate from replenishable sources, like the wind and sun. And bonus, these clean energy sources don't emit carbon, a heat-trapping gas, and relying more on wind and solar is one of the biggest things we can do to address climate change and protect the environment. Tapping into sources like these is becoming a huge part of Michigan's energy mix, which is great for both the environment and our economy. Okay, so how do I know this? I don't work at DTE. Luckily, I know two incredible people who do, Chris and Vielka, and I think they're around here somewhere. Hey, Davis. What's going on, Davis? All right, so you're two of 11,000 DTE employees who work to serve us with energy 24 seven. And you're doing it with clean energy, right? Tell us what that means. Definitely. So I spend most of my time working with solar energy, deciding where to build solar parks. But one of the best parts about my job is that I work with people from so many different fields. I meet with city planners, financial analysts, environmental scientists, and even wildlife experts. Working in energy provides opportunities for people with a really broad range of skills and interests. But Chris, why does all of this matter? How will the work you're doing make a difference? Well, in addition to powering people's homes and businesses, the work we're doing is helping combat climate change, which is more important today than ever. Changing weather patterns, effects on wildlife habitats, and rising sea levels are all negative consequences of climate change. Reducing carbon emissions that contribute to greenhouse gases is one way we can help address this global crisis. For me, this means finding ways to increase generation from the wind and sun. At DTE, we're committed to doing our part to reduce carbon emissions, working with customers, communities, government, and industry to find solutions that will help us create a more sustainable future. Vioka, what do you like most about your job? How does the work you're doing impact Michigan's future? Well, like Chris said, working in energy provides a lot of different opportunities. I love working with new technologies and being part of a team that's generating cleaner energy for Michigan. And protecting the environment is important to me too. But what's really awesome about the work Chris and I do, we're helping DTE reach their net zero carbon emissions goal. Net zero? What's that? Essentially, DTE has committed to retire all of its coal-fired power plants by 2032 replacing them with energy generated from cleaner sources like natural gas, wind, and solar. That means that by 2050, DTE's carbon footprint will be net zero. Achieving a net zero carbon footprint means that we're balancing remaining carbon emissions with carbon removal, or simply eliminating carbon emissions altogether. Net zero, that sounds like a great move for the planet. But what happens when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing? How do you ensure that people and businesses have the power they need? Well, that's a good question. DTE is all about providing everybody with safe, reliable, affordable energy. And as you mentioned, one challenge we currently face with renewable energy is variability. Depending on the weather, we might not produce enough power from renewable energy, or we may produce more than we need at a specific time. And so far, we don't have an affordable, scalable way to store this energy for future use. So we need to look at other sources to provide 24-7 on-demand electricity. Natural gas is abundant, affordable, and always available, so it's a great resource to complement our transition to renewables. In 2022, DTE began operating the Blue Water Energy Center, a state-of-the-art natural gas combined cycle plant that offers energy that's 70% cleaner than coal-fired power plants, an investment of nearly $1 billion. We also continue to generate carbon-free energy from our Fermi 2 nuclear power plant. 
Michigan also has a giant man-made reservoir that generates hydropower and acts like a massive battery that can provide energy on a moment's notice. This reservoir is a Ludington pump storage power plant, and it sits on a 1,000-acre site along Lake Michigan's shoreline. The plant pumps water from Lake Michigan uphill to the 27 billion gallon reservoir at low energy demand times and releases the stored water downhill through six massive turbines to generate electricity when demand is higher. DTE co-owns this plant with Consumers Energy and it is one of the largest pump storage facilities in the United States. Wow, it sounds like we're on the right path as we look towards the future of clean energy. Well, Vioka, Chris, thank you so much for sharing with us. We have a lot more in store today, so it's time to get going. Thanks, Davis. Have a great field trip. Okay, guys, before we take off on today's adventures, you should know the basics about how energy is generated. Power comes to us in the form of electrical energy, which is caused by the flow of electrons. That's the negatively charged particles found orbiting the nucleus inside atoms. Electricity is what we've named the flow of this electrical energy. The journey of electricity can cover hundreds of miles. We start at a generating station, which might be a wind park, a power plant, a hydroelectric or nuclear power plant, or a solar park. Each of these generating stations has the same purpose, to generate electrical energy. No matter where this energy is generated, it follows the same path to our homes, schools, and businesses, traveling across a network of lines, transformer stations, transmission towers, and substations, collectively called the power grid. Once electrical energy is created, it goes to a transformer station where it's transformed up to a higher voltage so it can travel more efficiently. It then travels across high voltage transmission lines between transmission towers, making its way to a substation. There, it's converted back to a lower and safer level of power. This lower voltage energy travels along power lines, just like the ones you see in your neighborhood, finally making its way to our homes, schools, and businesses. Pretty interesting, right? The electricity that's powering everything around you, including this screen, might have traveled hundreds of miles to get to you. Speaking of hundreds of miles, let's get going. Our first stop is one of Michigan's largest wind parks, Polaris, located in Gratiot County, about two hours north of Detroit. See you there. Welcome to Polaris, everyone, one of Michigan's largest wind parks commissioned around Earth Day 2020. Polaris has 68 wind turbines capable of generating 168 megawatts of clean energy, which is enough clean energy to power more than 64,000 Michigan homes. You might notice that mid-Michigan is home to several of our state's largest wind parks. That's because there's plenty of wide open space there, like farmland. Farming communities are ideal locations for wind parks. Turbines need space to operate. They perform best when spaced apart so they don't compete with each other. And there's plenty of space between them and the nearest buildings. Today's modern wind turbines might remind you of windmills, which have been used for centuries and the principle of using the wind to generate power is still the same. While windmills are relatively simple machines, often with four wide blades to capture the wind, today's wind turbines are complex, generally consisting of three large, long blades, highly sophisticated sensors and technology, and over 8,000 individual parts. While wind turbines are independently powered by the wind, like windmills, they're also connected through underground cables, working together as a single unit or generating station. DTE employees can spend three to five years planning and building each wind park. They begin by measuring the area's wind resources and studying the surrounding environment to mitigate the impact on local wildlife, especially birds and bats. They measure sound levels and even collect soil samples. All things considered, before building a wind park, DTE typically needs to obtain more than 200 different permits. Farmers who have turbines built in their fields receive annual payments for use of the land. While tall, wind turbines don't take up more than an acre or so of land, leaving farmers plenty of room to grow their crops. Communities that host wind energy projects also benefit. Companies like DTE pay property taxes on its wind parks, 
and these funds go where the projects are located and can be used to support schools, roads, and other community infrastructure. The projects also bring jobs and other economic benefits to rural communities. Okay, so let's talk about how wind parks are constructed. Wind turbines are big, so putting them together, that's no easy task. Mapping the route to get the turbine components to the construction site takes a lot of planning and coordination. Imagine trying to make a sharp turn or driving down a narrow road or driving under a highway overpass with these gigantic parts on your truck bed. Once the parts arrive at the park, several things need to happen before the turbines can begin generating energy. Construction crews need to dig trenches and lay the underground cable that connects the turbines. Cement trucks arrive to pour each turbine's concrete base. Then anchor bolts are carefully placed and cemented in. After the concrete is dry and the base has passed all the required quality inspections, crews can begin erecting the turbines. Each component is power washed before the assembly starts. Very large cranes are used to lift each turbine component and move it into position. Construction begins with the tower sections. Full towers usually have three or four sections. After the first tower section is installed, crews climb inside. As the crane moves the next part into position, the crews bolt the sections together. They follow the same process all the way up the tower until the turbine construction is complete. The nacelle is attached next. Then the final step is attaching the rotor, which consists of a central hub and all three blades. Now if the weather cooperates and the equipment is in place, crews can do this part of the construction in just one day. Now that we watched the wind turbine go up, let's learn how turbines, like the ones operated by DTE, create energy. Essentially, as turbines' blades rotate, they capture the wind's energy. Those rotating blades activate gears inside the turbine, spinning faster and faster, which ultimately generates electricity. The amount of energy produced depends on the size of the turbine and the wind speed through the rotor. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a turbine. What you don't see when you're looking at a turbine is the foundation beneath it. It takes approximately 384 yards of concrete, or 40 truckloads, along with 35 tons of reinforced steel to build the foundation. The final step involves creating a pedestal, the only part of the foundation that remains visible. Next, you'll see the three tower sections. Each one is 50 to 70 feet tall and weighs 260 tons. That's like 40 times the weight of an elephant. Then comes the nacelle, sitting on top of the tower. For reference, it's about the size of a small school bus and weighs approximately 63 tons. The nacelle houses many important components, including the gearbox, low and high speed shafts, a generator, the controller, and the brake. These components work together to transform the wind energy into electrical energy. On top of the nacelle sits the anemometer, which reads wind speed, and the wind vane, which reads wind direction. These are important since they communicate directly with the nacelle's controller. The controller turns the wind turbine on when there's sufficient wind to capture and turns it off when wind speeds get too high or too low. The controller also tells the nacelle and rotor which direction to face. The rotor and blades are connected to the nacelle. Each blade is about 160 feet long and weighs seven tons, made of fiberglass reinforced polyester. One thing you may have noticed, wind turbines are tall. Most wind turbines in Michigan are just under 500 feet tall when the tip of the turbine blade is in its highest position. For reference, the Statue of Liberty is 305 feet high. DTE performs regular maintenance on all of its turbines to keep them running safely and efficiently. With a team on the ground that monitors the turbines 24-7, 365 days per year, using a system called SCADA. This system tells the team what's happening at each turbine in real time, and it enables the team to run diagnostic tests and remotely turn a turbine on or off whenever they need to. Okay, ready to head inside? Now DTE is gonna shut this turbine down so we can safely proceed down the access road and inside the turbine. Now, if we were physically at the wind park, instead of seeing it virtually, each of you would need to wear a hard hat, high visibility safety vest, and safety glasses like these. The technicians who work inside the towers use similar equipment, along with gloves and steel-toed boots. All right, let's follow our wind technician as he heads inside one of the turbines at Polaris. The first pieces of equipment you see when you open the turbine door are the down tower assembly, 
a ladder, a tool hoist, and generator power cabling. The down tower assembly is the turbine's brain. It houses the electrical converter and helps connect the turbine to the grid. Okay, it's time to start climbing approximately 300 feet up inside the tower. Luckily, most turbines are now equipped with lift assistance systems, or climb assists, and technicians can also rest on platforms between the tower sections. Still, it's a long way to the top. Technicians work both inside and outside of the turbine and can carry tools and equipment that weigh more than 25 pounds. Let's get a view from the top of the nacelle, something few people will ever get to see. The instrumentation you're seeing now is the anemometer and the wind vane. Remember what these parts do? They're sending messages to the controller about the speed and direction of the wind. If you're afraid of heights, a career as a wind technician probably isn't for you. But if you can handle being strapped in 300 feet off the ground, you'd get to experience the most incredible views like this sunrise all the time. So what do you think of the wind park? Seeing the view from the top of the wind turbine was incredible. Something you guys wouldn't have been able to do in person. But it has me wondering what other jobs might exist in wind energy. Maybe even a few that keep you closer to the ground. <laughs> You know, it turns out you don't have to climb the height of a wind turbine to contribute to the future of wind energy. Now, we've talked about the people who build the wind parks and those who help maintain them. We've also learned about the biologists, environmental scientists, and researchers who study the local ecology to minimize interactions with wildlife. Other jobs involve working with landowners, communities, and local officials who may be interested in having a wind park in their area. The wind industry offers career opportunities for people with a wide range of educational backgrounds, from technical training to advanced level graduate degrees, like business analysts, lawyers, and public policy professionals. The wind and solar fields are growing rapidly and offer a ton of different career paths for students to explore. Imagine being part of a team that helps fight climate change. Amazing. But let's talk about our other big source of renewable energy the sun. Now our next stop is about 80 miles east of us in Lapeer. There, we'll visit DTE's Lapeer Solar Park, the first large solar farm in Michigan, to discover how we're harnessing the sun to power communities all across the state. See you soon. Hey guys, welcome to Lapeer. Not only is this one of the largest solar parks in Michigan, but it's one of the largest solar parks east of the Mississippi River. And DTE has been generating energy here since May 2017. Built on 250 acres, Lapeer Solar Park includes almost 200,000 solar panels. Now each solar panel contains 72 individual solar cells, and together they're capable of generating enough energy to power almost 11,000 homes. And by 2040, DTE will generate energy for more than 11 million solar panels. The average lifespan of a solar panel is about 25 to 35 years. But the good news is, after a solar panel has stopped working, almost all of its materials can be recycled, plus one for the environment. <laughs> you might not know this, but solar and wind are actually a pretty complementary pair. In Michigan, wind turbines tend to produce more energy at night, and in the winter. But solar parks generate more power during the daytime, especially during the summer months. Together, wind and solar energy give us access to renewable energy all year long, day and night. So let's talk about solar panels. Maybe you've come across some in your neighborhood or noticed a few while road tripping across Michigan. Solar parks are often comprised of tens of thousands of solar panels. When multiple panels are linked together, they form an array these solar arrays must be built on an area of flat land, then separated so the panels don't throw shade on each other when the sun's position changes throughout the day or from month to month. That's right, we have to separate the panels so they don't throw shade. In the winter, the sun is lower on the horizon. In the summer, the sun is almost directly above us because we're located in the northern hemisphere. 
Solar panels are positioned pointing south and arranged at a 25 degree angle to maximize the amount of sunlight that will directly hit each panel. The 25 degree angle of solar panels represents an average of summer and winter times when the panels can capture the most energy from the sun. Future solar arrays will have the ability to move with the sun, like sunflowers do, or track the sun's rays for even greater efficiency. In addition, solar parks are remotely monitored to track the intensity of sunlight, which helps us estimate how much power the park could generate. And even on cloudy days, employees monitor the arrays just as closely, since the panels are still absorbing sun. Think of it this way. It's the same reason you can still get a sunburn when it's cloudy outside. Unlike wind and other energy sources, solar energy doesn't require a generator to create electrical energy. Instead, solar energy relies on a reaction that happens inside the solar panels. Let me break it down for you. Believe it or not, the part of the solar panel where electricity is generated is mostly made of sand, sand that gets converted to silicon. Solar panels are comprised of hundreds of photovoltaic cells, meaning they're capable of producing an electrical current. When the sun's rays shine down on the panel silicon, they cause the electrons inside the silicon to get excited and break their orbit. This movement of electrons is completely random, so in order for the electrons to flow together, they need a path to travel on, like on a wire. Now connecting a wire to metal plates does just that. It creates a pathway for the electrons to flow, resulting in DC, or direct current. Okay, that's how a solar panel generates electrical energy. But where does this current go? The DC electricity from the solar cells is captured and fed to an inverter, where it's converted to AC, or alternating current, so it can efficiently travel over long distances. This energy travels across high voltage power lines to a step-down transformer, where it's converted to a lower and safer level of power before traveling across power lines to your home. The electrical energy generated from solar parks enters the power grid, just like everything else, and joins the energy mix with other sources, like wind and natural gas. So, the power you use in your home could have been generated by natural gas, the sun, or the wind. Each year, DTE customers are receiving more and more of their energy from renewable sources. You know, there's actually another really cool thing happening in solar parks these days. Something that has little to do with energy. To show you what I mean, we're gonna fly on over to Detroit's O'Shea Solar Park. This is O'Shea Solar Park, located in Detroit, Michigan. While it's smaller than Lapeer, there's something really special here, and that's bees. Now, do you eat chocolate, drink coffee, or enjoy strawberries? If you do, you're depending on the daily activities of bees, bats, butterflies, and other animals that pollinate our food. In fact, one in every three bites of food we eat depend on healthy pollinators. But you might be thinking, what do these creatures have to do with solar parks? As you know, the habitats of bees and other pollinating species are rapidly disappearing. But with the rise and affordability of new solar parks, some researchers see this as an amazing opportunity to reclaim land for pollinators by replacing the usual grass or gravel at solar parks with wildflowers, which produce nectar. And pollinators love nectar. DTE already has more than 30 pollinator gardens at its properties, and every new solar park it opens in the future will have its own pollinator garden. At O'Shea, DTE is working with Bees in the D, a nonprofit organization working to protect the health of honeybee colonies. Right now, Bees in the D manages 160 honeybee hives at 50 locations across Michigan. At O'Shea, 20,000 honeybees, including two queen bees, were recently relocated into two empty hives inside the solar park. Each hive will eventually grow to house more than 60,000 bees. Here at O'Shea, they'll spend the rest of their lives pollinating native plants, flowers, and gardens, buzzing amongst the solar panels. Another bonus, in addition to being good for the environment, planting vegetation underneath solar panels contributes to solar panel operation. The plant cover creates a cooler microclimate around the solar panels, and this cooling effect increases the panel's efficiency. 
You know, all this talk of honey and pollination is giving me a crazy sugar craving. <laughs> Anybody else hungry? Let's head back to DTE. So, what'd you think? We got to visit super tall wind turbines and a vast solar park, and even learned a little bit about pollination. We saw a few things that, honestly, we would never have been able to experience if we were there in person. But when it comes to learning about renewable energy, why are we spending time talking about this? Why does it all matter? Think back to what Velka and Chris said at the beginning. It's all about reducing our carbon footprint by producing cleaner, carbon emission-free energy. That's how we'll fight climate change and create a more sustainable future. So I guess the only question that remains is, what can we do? And it turns out, a lot. First, you can reduce your carbon footprint by joining one of DTE's voluntary renewable energy programs. These programs enable you to participate in DTE's wind and solar parks, which reduces your carbon footprint and drives demand for more renewable energy in Michigan. But if you do want to install solar panels on your roof, DTE can help you safely connect your solar equipment to the grid too. Next, reducing the amount of energy you use, or waste, is really important. At DTE, they like to say, the cleanest, least expensive kilowatt of power is the one you don't use. DTE offers a number of programs, tips, and rebates to help save energy and lower your bill. And if you and your family are new to energy efficiency, you can schedule a free home energy consultation on DTE's website. An energy expert will come to your house and provide a basic overview of ways to save, plus install free energy saving products. DTE can also help you recycle your old refrigerator or freezer, save money on products like Energy Star LED light bulbs, and so much more. Visit dteenergy.com for more ideas on how you can use energy more efficiently. At the end of the day, using energy more efficiently helps us protect the environment and fight climate change. So the future is a cleaner place for us all. And that's the point, right? Thank you all for spending time with us today. We really hope you had fun on this virtual field trip and learned something new about energy. See you later.